Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Antic Hay by Aldous Huxley, a novel. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb. It's a long blurb, actually. It's like, it's, I've never, well, I have seen it before, but it's not very common. The blurb on the back is uh, continued inside the, the rear here. Um, but we're going to go through it anyway, then I'll check out some of my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Before we get started, one thing I want to quickly say is that it reminded me of John Steinbeck in a good way. Um, the way that... Uh, Oh, Biggie, watch out. You're going to knock the camera down. You're going to knock the camera down. Uh, the way Steinbeck and Huxley, in this novel at least, sort of take everyday situations, everyday characters, and then use them to hold up a mirror to the world that we live in. It's not very plot-driven, but I'm not necessarily bothered about that. I'm, I'm not all about that life. And he uses it as a great way, as like a vehicle for his ideology. So I think later on with like A Brave New World, he kind of perfected the approach of mixing storyline with ideology, but uh, there's still a lot to love here, so let's go in and check it out. Dane reads. The name of Aldous Huxley, which became known in the 20s, rapidly developed into a password for his generation. At cocktail parties, which were becoming fashionable in the same period, it was bandied about as if the mere mention of it were enough to show that one were brilliant, witty, and cynically up to date. What was behind the eclat of Huxley's success? To start with, as Cyril Connolly has written, witty, serious, observant, well-read, sensitive, intelligent, there can have been few young writers as gifted as Huxley. Born in 1894, he belongs to a family of great talent. He is the grandson of the famous Thomas Henry Huxley, the son of Leonard Huxley, the director of the Cornhill magazine, and the brother of Dr. Julian Huxley. He was educated at Eton and Balliol, and before devoting himself entirely to writing, worked as a journalist and dramatic critic. He first attracted attention with a volume of stories published in 1920, following this up with his provoking and amusing novel Chrome Yellow 1921, and in 1922 with some more stories in the same vein, Mortal Coils, which contains the Geoconda Smile, later made into a successful play. Oh, I thought there was going to be a comma after that. His next novel, Antic Hay, 1923, a brilliant satire gave us an accurate picture of the aimless life of various intellectuals after the First World War. Indeed, Huxley was accused of approving of their outlook. Those Barren Leaves, 1925, his next novel, also describes an incongruous group of people in this period of social unrest. But the accusations of his less perceptive critics were completely off the mark, for in spite of Huxley's brilliant sense of light comedy, he has always been fundamentally serious. Too good an artist to become a preacher, he has never disguised his disillusionment, which in one form or another has been the basis of his satire. In 1928, Point Counterpoint, the outstanding novel which was the culmination of this early period, appeared. It was followed in 1932 by Brave New World, which has become not only one of his best-known books, but also one of the three or four best-known books of the 30s, satirising as it does the utopia resulting from the popular idea of progress. Four years later, he produced a further tour de force, Eilis in Gaza, 1936, in which, while experimenting with the chronological sequence, Huxley showed himself for the first time to be a mystic, a role with which he has been preoccupied since he went to live in California in 1937. As a result, he has become more and more concerned in his books with contrasting reality and illusion. After Many a Summer, which appeared in 1939, is a fantastic parable treating of the ultimate topics of philosophy, and at the same time a nightmarish tale as brilliant and amusing as anything Huxley has written. As well as novelist, Aldous Huxley is a writer in many different genres. He has written poems, biographies, travel books, essays, plays, a book about curing bad eyesight, books of a political nature, and most recently an essay on perception, based on his conclusions about the effect of the drug mescaline. In fact, he is one of the most versatile writers of his age. Music at Night, 1931, a selection of essays ranging over a wide variety of subjects, and Beyond the Mexique Bay, 1934, a, jo a traveller's journal of an excursion to Guatemala and Mexico, have been chosen to represent Huxley's non-fiction in this Penguin selection of his books. All right. And so we get this little bit uh, about education and the education system, which I thought was really interesting. Mr. Gumbrell made an impatient gesture. You're talking nonsense, he said. The only point of the kind of education you had is this. It gives a young man leisure to find out what he's interested in. You apparently weren't sufficiently interested in anything. I am interested in everything, interrupted Gumbrell Jr. Which comes to the same thing, said his father, parenthetically, as being interested in nothing. And he went on from the point at which he had been interrupted. You weren't sufficiently interested in anything to want to devote yourself to it. That was why you sought the last refuge of feeble minds with classical educations. You became a schoolmaster. Come, come, said Mr. Porteous. I do a little teaching myself. I must stand up for the profession. Gumbrell Sr. let go of his beard and brushed back the hair that the wind of his own vehemence had brought tumbling into his eyes. I don't denigrate the profession, he said. Not at all. It would be an excellent profession if everyone who went into it were as much interested in teaching as you are in your job, Porteous, or I in mine. It's these undecided creatures like Theodore 
who ruin it by drifting in. Until all teachers are geniuses and enthusiasts, nobody will learn anything except what they teach themselves. Still, said Mr. Porteous, I wish I hadn't had to learn so much by myself. I wasted a lot of time finding out how to set to work and where to discover what I wanted. Gumbrel Jr. was lighting his pipe. I've come to the conclusion, he said, speaking in little jerks between each suck of the flame into the bowl, that most people ought never to be taught anything at all. He threw away the match. Lord have mercy upon us, they're dogs. What's the use of teaching them anything except to behave well, to work and obey? Facts, theories, the truth about the universe, what good are those to them? Teach them to understand. Why, it only confuses them, makes them lose hold of the simple real appearance. Not more than one in a hundred can get any good out of a scientific or literary education. And you're one of the ones, asked his father. That goes without saying, Gumbrel Jr. replied. And then we get this again, just these great rants of like Huxley railing against his, you know, his, just it spouts in his ideology basically, so. And what good do you expect the revolution to do, Mr. Bojanus? He asked at last. Mr. Bojanus replaced his hand in his bosom. None whatsoever, Mr. Gumbrel, he said, none whatever. But liberty, Gumbrel suggested, equality and all that. What about those, Mr. Bojanus? Mr. Bajana smiled up at him tolerantly and kindly, as he might have smiled at someone who had suggested, should we say, that evening trousers should be turned up at the bottom. Liberty, Mr. Gumbrel, he said. You don't suppose any serious-minded person imagines a revolution is going to bring liberty, do you? The people who make the revolution always seem to ask for liberty. But do they ever get it, Mr. Gumbrel? Mr. Bajanus cocked his head playfully and smiled. Look at history, Mr. Gumbrel, look at history. First it's the French Revolution, they ask for political liberty, and they get it. Then comes the Reform Bill, then 48, then all the Franchise Acts and votes for women. Always more and more political liberty. And what's the result, Mr. Gumbrel? Nothing at all. Who's freer for political liberty? Not a soul, Mr. Gumbrel. There was never a greater swindle hatched in the whole of history. And when you think how those poor young men like Shelley talked about it, it's pathetic, said Mr. Bajana, shaking his head. Really pathetic. Political liberty is a swindle because a man doesn't spend his time being political. He spends it sleeping, eating, amusing himself a little and working, mostly working. When they got all the political liberty they wanted, or found they didn't want, they began to understand this. And so now it's all for the Industrial Revolution, Mr. Gumbrel. But bless you, that's as big a swindle as the other. How can there ever be liberty under any system? No amount of profit sharing or self-government by the workers, no amount of hygienic conditions or cocoa villages or recreation grounds can get rid of the fundamental slavery, the necessity of working. Liberty? Why, it doesn't exist. There's no liberty in this world, only gilded cages. And then, Mr. Gumbrel, even suppose you could somehow get rid of the necessity of working. Suppose a man's time was all ledger. Would he be free then? I say nothing of the natural slavery of eating and sleeping and all that, Mr. Gumbrel. I say nothing of that because that, if I may say so, would be too air-splitting and metaphysical. But what I do ask you is this. And Mr. Bajanus waggled his forefinger almost menacingly at the sleeping partner in this dialogue. Would a man with unlimited leisure be free, Mr. Gumbrel? I say he would not. Not unless he happened to be a man like you or me, Mr. Gumbrel. A man of sense, a man of independent judgment. An ordinary man would not be free, because he wouldn't know how to occupy his leisure except in some way that would be forced on him by other people. People don't know how to entertain themselves now. They leave it to other people to do it for them. They swallow what's given them. They have to swallow it, whether they like it or not. Cinemas, newspapers, magazines, gramophones, football matches, wireless telephones. Take them or leave them if you want to amuse yourself. The ordinary man can't leave them. He takes, and what's that but slavery? And so you see, Mr. Gumbrel, Mr. Bajana smiled with a kind of roguish triumph. You see that even in the purely hypothetical case of a man with indefinite leisure, there would still be no freedom. And the case, as I have said, is purely hypothetical, at any rate so far as concerns the sort of people who want a revolution. And as for the sort of people who do enjoy leisure, even now, why I think, Mr. Gumbrel, you and I know enough about the best people to know that freedom, except possibly sexual freedom, is not their strongest point. And sexual freedom, what's that? Mr. Bajanus dramatically inquired. You and I, Mr. Gumbrel, he answered confidentially, we know. It's an horrible, idiot slavery, that's what it is. Or am I wrong, Mr. Gumbrel? He ain't wrong, I tell you that. And then we, a little bit further on we get, But in that case, Mr. Bajanus, why are you so anxious to have a revolution? Gumbrel inquired. Thoughtfully, Mr. Bajanus twisted to a finer point his wax moustaches. Well, he said at last, it would be a nice change. I was always one for change and a little excitement. And then there's the scientific interest. You never quite know how an experiment would turn out, do you, Mr. Gumbrel? I remember when I was a boy, my old dad, a great gardener he was, a regular floriculturist, you might say, Mr. Gumbrel. He tried the experiment of grafting a sprig of Gloire de Dijon onto a black currant bush. And would you believe it? The roses came out black, coal black, Mr. Gumbrel. Nobody would ever have guessed that if the thing had never been tried. And that's what I say about the revolution. You don't know what will come of it till you try. Black roses, blue roses, who knows, Mr. Gumbrel, who knows? So we get this 
weird rhyme. <laughs> Christ-like is my behaviour. Like every good believer, I imitate the saviour and cultivate a beaver. We get this great little exchange here. You don't seem to take much interest in us, she repeated. Shearwater shook his heavy head. No, he said, I don't think I do. Why don't you? Why should I? There's not time to be interested in everything. One can only be interested in what's worthwhile. And we're not worthwhile. Not to me personally, replied Shearwater with candor. The Great Wall of China, the political situation in Italy, the habits of trematodes, all these are most interesting in themselves, but they aren't interesting to me. I don't permit them to be. I haven't the leisure. We get this as well, I just think more great writing. He looked, Mrs. Viviash thought, peculiarly ugly when he laughed. His face seemed to go all to pieces. Not a corner of it, but was wrinkled and distorted by the violent grimace of mirth. Even the forehead was ruined when he laughed. Foreheads are generally the human part of people's faces. Let the nose twitch and the mouth and the eyes twinkle as monkeyishly as you like. The forehead can still be calm and serene. The forehead still knows how to be human. But when Casimir laughed, his forehead joined in the general disintegrating grimace. And sometimes even when he wasn't laughing, when he was just vivaciously talking, his forehead seemed to lose its calm and would twitch and wrinkle itself in a dreadful kind of agitation. Uh, another really interesting line. I think this is a good sign of the times this was written, you know. Photography, he pronounced, with that temporary earnestness which made him seem an enthusiast about everything, is a mixed blessing. It has made it possible to reproduce pictures so easily and cheaply that all the bad artists who were well occupied in the past making engravings of good men's paintings are now free to do bad original work of their own. All this was terribly impersonal, he told himself, terribly off the point. He was losing ground. He must do something drastic to win it back. But what? Another great just passage here I want to share. People are queer, he said after one of his silences. Very queer. One has no idea how queer they are. Gumbrell laughed. But I have a very clear idea of their queerness, he said. Everyone's queer, and the ordinary respectable bourgeois people are the queerest of the lot. How do they manage to live like that? It's astonishing. When I think of all my aunts and uncles, he shook his head. Perhaps it's because I'm rather incurious, said Shearwater. One ought to be curious, I think. I've come to feel lately that I've not been curious enough about people. The particulars began to peep alive an individual out of the vagueness like rabbits. Gumbrell saw them in his fancy at the fringe of a wood. Quite, he said encouragingly, quite. Little passage here. And has nobody tried to make love to you since then, he asked. Oh, lots of them have tried. And not succeeded? She shook her head. I don't like men, she said. They're hateful, most of them. They're brutes. Fair. And uh, Gumbrell here again, some great little bit of wisdom here. He says, one should never drink at luncheon, said Gumbrell. It wrecks the afternoon. One should also never think of the past and never for one moment consider the future. These are treasures of ancient wisdom, but perhaps after a little tea. And then chapter 16 takes the form of like a play dialogue. The doctor says, in 1921, 27,913 women died in childbirth, the husband. But none of them belonged to my harem. Each of them was somebody's wife. Doubtless, but the people we don't know are only characters in the human comedy. We are the tragedians. Yeah, we tend to put ourselves centre stage a lot, don't we? We get this little um, conversation here, which is absolutely charming, but also kind of how I think. When I look at all these revolting houses, the old gentleman continued, shaking his fist at the snuggeries of the season ticket holders, I am filled with indignation. I feel my spleen ready to burst, sir, ready to burst. I can sympathise with you, said Gumbrell. The architecture is certainly not very soothing. It's not the architecture I mind so much, retorted the old gentleman. That's merely a question of art and all nonsense as far as I'm concerned. What disgusts me is the people inside the architecture, the number of them, sir, and the way they breed, like maggots, sir, like maggots. Millions of them creeping about the face of the country, spreading blight and dirt wherever they go, ruining everything. It's the people I object to. Ah, well, said Gumbrell, if you will have sanitary conditions that don't allow plagues to flourish properly, if you will tell mothers how to bring up their children instead of allowing nature to kill them off in her natural way, if you will import unlimited supplies of corn and meat, what can you expect? Of course the numbers will go up. All right, now this is another good old-fashioned rant that uh, I want to read out to you. This is a page and a half, so bear with me here. Yes, it was my basso in Gegno, my low genius which did not know how to draw love from you, nor beauty from the materials of which art is made. Ah, now you'll smile to yourself and say, poor Casimir, he has come to admit that at last. Yes, yes, I have come to admit everything. That I couldn't paint, I couldn't write, I couldn't make music, that I was a charlatan and a quack, that I was a ridiculous actor of heroic parts who deserved to be laughed at and was laughed at. 
But then every man is ludicrous if you look at him from outside without taking into account what's going on in his heart and mind. You could turn Hamlet into an epigrammatic farce with an inimitable scene when he takes his adored mother in adultery. You could make the wittiest Guy de Maupassant short story out of the life of Christ by contrasting the mad rabbi's pretensions with his abject fate. It's a question of the point of view. Everyone's a walking farce and a walking tragedy at the same time. The man who slips on a banana skin and fractures his skull describes against the sky as he falls the most richly comical arabesque. And you, Myra, what do you suppose the unsympathetic gossips say of you? What sort of a farce of the boulevards is your life in their eyes? For me, Myra, you seem to move all the time through some nameless and incomprehensible tragedy. For them, you're what? Merely any sort of a wanton with amusing adventures. And what am I? A charlatan, a quack, a pretentious, boasting, rhodomontading imbecile, incapable of painting anything but vermouth posters. Why did that hurt so terribly? I don't know. There was no reason why you shouldn't think so if you wanted to. I was all that and grotesquely laughable. And very likely your laughter was justified. Your judgement was true. I don't know. I can't tell. Perhaps I am a charlatan. Perhaps I'm insincere, boasting to others, deceiving myself. I don't know, I tell you. Everything is confusion in my mind now. The whole fabric seems to have tumbled to pieces. It lies in a horrible chaos. I can make no order within myself. Have I lied to myself? Have I acted and postured the great man to persuade myself that I am one? Have I something in me or nothing? Have I ever achieved anything of worth? Anything that rhymed with my conceptions, my dreams? For those were fine, of that I am certain. I look into the chaos that is my soul and I tell you I don't know, I don't know. But what I do know is that I've spent nearly 20 years now playing the charlatan at whom you all laugh. That I've suffered in mind and in body too, almost from hunger sometimes in order to play it. That I've struggled, that I've exultantly climbed to the attack, that I've been thrown down, ah, many times, that I've picked myself up and started again. Well, I suppose all that's ludicrous if you like to think of it that way. It is ludicrous that a man should put himself to prolonged inconvenience for the sake of something which doesn't really exist at all. It's exquisitely comic, I can see. I can see it in the abstract, so to speak. But in this particular case, you must remember I'm not a dispassionate observer. And if I am overcome now, it is not with laughter. It is with an indescribable unhappiness, with the bitterness of death itself. Death, death, death. I repeat the word to myself again and again. I think of death, I try to imagine it. I hang over it looking down where the stones fall and fall and there is one horrible noise. And then silence again, looking down into the well of death. It is so deep that there is no glittering eye of water to be seen at the bottom. I have no candle to send down. It is horrible, but I do not want to go on living. Living would be worse than... And then just this last line I want to read out here and very short. By the 21st century, I believe, we should all be telepaths. Well, yes and no. We're not telepathic, obviously, but we do sort of all have direct connections to each other's brains through social media and Twitter updates and stuff. So yeah, Antic Hay, a novel by Aldous Huxley. 3.5 out of 5, but a strong one. Did enjoy it. I would recommend this to you if you're a Huxley fan. If you're a uh, John Steinbeck fan, I think you'll like it as well. And uh, if you've enjoyed the excerpts that I've read, check it out. So there we have it, that's what I made of Antic Hay by Aldous Huxley. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.